Hey, how's it going? I'm trying to do things in the right order this time. So let me just start off with I only review shows I like, and so there's only good reviews. And all these with the spoilers, like just expect it. It's opinion commentary strictly for your entertainment. Um, and right now, oh, I think I turned it down so much that you can't even hear it. But if you do happen to hear anything playing in the background, is Spiritual Energy Shield, uh, Golden Shield Protection by Meditation Music, 999 hertz. Uh, I think that's all. Oh, yes, and this channel is not monetized, so... Uh, that's for the benefit of meditation music. Like, I'm not profiting you anything here. I'm not incoming income, so you're all good. And I hope I am with you. Okay, so today I want to talk about number two in my series of Brendan Fraser uh, appreciation. And it is, or actually, let me take that back. This is not going to be number two. This is going to be number something else. <laughs> I'll let you know. Um, and that's due to uh, some planning I already have in mind. And I don't really need to share the details of with you. So the, the movie I want to talk about is Gods and Monsters. And I didn't find out what year it came out. I'll have to put that in the information box below the video. <clears throat> it stars... Ian McKellen, he plays James, Jimmy Wayne, uh, and Brendan Fraser as Clay Clayton Boone. It also has, uh, and I thought this is uh, unusual, and I, I haven't really, like, searched down why this is, but in The Mummy, which was the first movie I talked about, uh, there was an actor named Kevin J. O'Connor, and he played Benny, and he was a weaselly little scammer guy. And I was sort of surprised to see that Kevin J. O'Connor is also in Gods and Monsters, and his character is Harry, and he's a friend of uh, Jimmy Whale. Uh, okay, um, well, uh, the other pertinent characters are... Why did I write this so small? <laughs> Hannah, played by Lynn Redgrave. And the Redgrave name, if you've seen films and you're over like 30, 40 years old, you'll know that she comes from sort of an acting dynasty, dynasty family. Uh, her father was Sir Michael Redgrave, and I don't know him from anything because I'm not that old. <laughs> And his wife was somebody, too, and I didn't write her name down because I just plain had never heard of her. Sorry, no disrespect, but, you know, <laughs> you're going to get, like, what's most recent and what a viewer is most going to probably know about. And then also, you know, my own <laughs> shade will fall across things, like, not including someone because, to me, they don't have relevance, really. And then also... Um, there are other red graves like Vanessa is her sister and she they recently I'm, I'm not going to talk about that never mind that that's enough you, you get the idea with the red graves and so Lynn plays Hannah the maid the maid of Jim Whale <clears throat> and she's pretty crucial to the whole package so let me talk about just the movie itself first um technically it was really beautiful to, to look at and I always love a movie about old L.A. because I am from L.A. and I'm not as old as the old that I like. But I'm talking like, you know, well, this movie actually was periodically placed after the Korean War. So it's kind of weird to see something where the World War II hasn't happened because that had such a stark effect on the whole world. Like still issues from that time reverberating today, you know? So, um, you know, technically it's 
the lighting, like whoever did the lighting, just an artist. I mean, they really got like some flattering headshots, you know, or just like they must have had like a real appreciation for the human form <laughs> because whenever he, he, I assume it was a he, the cinematographer, is that the guy? I don't know. But whoever it was that, you know, decided what kind of lighting needed to be and then whoever filmed it, like they worked together so well. Like everyone just looks really beautiful. Um, and it's not like, oh, there's a bunch of makeup and there's no like effects because it's not one of those films. Yes, I do like stuff other than sci-fi. Woo, mind blowing. Um, it's just like I'm getting chills. It just makes me so nostalgic for a time that I wasn't even there for, though. <laughs> like, I love noir, you know? So it's kind of like that era with the bulbous cars and the the hairdo that Brendan Fraser is wearing. I think it's called a, a duck tail, but it's like akin to what Donald Trump does with his hair, but short and also not like... You can tell... As a person, he does not wear his hair that way because even with product in it, that hair was like, I don't really want to do this. <laughs> that was one spot where they kind of, maybe they probably couldn't really do anything about it, you know, <laughs> like without doing some serious stuff to the guy's hair. And I, I think it was already flocking in there, so they probably didn't want to do that either. Um, flocking is like filling in thin spots or just plain bald spots. A good example of flocking, if you, well, you, flocking, I think, just like a Christmas tree, it's meant to fill in thin areas. So I'm not sure if this is flocking, but if you watch any of the Elliot Stabler era of SBU, Law and Order, you will see his hairline go from pointy to brown and like, even the same episode, it's like changing like, like there's some kind of title stuff happening on his forehead. There's sedimentary business under his hairline. Um, I don't know. It, uh, it's just uh, a technical thing <laughs> that I learned somewhere along the way. But you don't have to have any experience, you know, working in the film industry to have noticed people's hair. One last digression about this. If you watch CSI, the guy that plays Nick, I don't know what's up with him and his eyebrows or the makeup artist, but I was like <laughs> watching them just over the years and have going through changes because I was like, is this what he wants? Does he like, I mean, I just was confused because it was like, sending me so many mixed messages from what I knew about the guy from reading about him. It was just like, what is happening? But anyway, that's makeup. <laughs> Not consistency. And digression over. So, uh, let's see. And the locations were very nice. It, Oh, I was going to talk about what it reminded me of, but I can't remember all of the stuff, so I'm not going to bring it up. But it did remind me of, like, old California and those <clears throat> sort of classic buildings that... Classic for a Los Angeles, you know, not particularly architecturally classic, because they're all sort of ish of something else, you know, like... I don't think I need to explain that statement further. <laughs> so anyway... It looked good. It sounded great. Uh, I mean, I didn't even really notice the soundtrack because it wasn't like pop culture hits, it, which is fine. It was pop culture hits of the time. So it was just like, yes, it was there. And on a certain level, I noticed it. And it was exactly what I would have expected to have been playing for the period. So, oh, there's a, sorry, I got distracted by an outside kitty. <laughs> The food dish is not out there right now. It's empty. That's why she came around. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I get distracted by cats easily. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, what was I babbling about? Oh, the music, the soundtrack, the score. It was nice. Okay. So, the content of the story, though, that's what I really want to talk about. Um... I'll just 
say a few things. Why am I prefacing my what I'm going to say with anything? Let me just say it. It's pretty well known that Ian McKellen in real life is gay, which is just a facet of his personality. It's neither here nor there. It's just a description. The character James Will is also gay, and he plays... Oh, gosh, I should have checked this. I didn't even think of it. I don't know, like, the actual director, writer, producer, whatever, of Frankenstein. I don't know that it was all one guy, like Jim, Jimmy Whale is in the movie. But in the movie, he wrote, directed, and sounds like did almost everything else of the Frankenstein movie that starred Boris Karloff. So there is a guy in there that also plays Boris Karloff. I think I wrote his name down. <sighs> Sorry, there is going to be some dead space with just my face sitting here in this. I'll have to add it at the end. But he's a known actor, but not currently. Like, I think the gentleman is actually deceased today. That played Boris Karloff. Boris Karloff is definitely deceased. Long time ago. Also a long time ago. I think I was alive for that. Very young, but hey, I was around. Uh, so, um, that is a, the, the homosexuality, though, is a main feature in the film. And, in fact, it almost happens like you would imagine, not just a gay porno, but just a porno beginning, which I haven't watched a lot of them until, like, last year or two years ago. But I'm aware of, like, the Pizza Man theme and, like, all of the innuendo and the silly puns which god i hate it when people do that in real life please don't do that to me <laughs> slight digression <laughs> excuse me um but brendan fraser is a vet marines and he gets a job through the uh maid i don't even really want to call her a maid or a servant but uh yeah, I'll, I'll go with serving because that's what she does and she's kind of into it, you know. So anyway, um, she somehow comes across Boone to do landscaping at Wales Home, which is like a Beverly Hills estate, which is grounds that need to be uh, lands kept <laughs> and, uh, or, you know, maintained by a landscaper, uh, landscaper, sorry, landscaper. What is that? Okay, brain fart, but landscaper, which gardener, whatever, same thing, you know. Uh, don't 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 go off onto a sidetrack. And so, um, Whale is unaware that he's been hired until he's working in his house or he's on his patio, and he sees this guy out, you know, like maintaining his grounds, mowing the lawn, and so on, and so. I don't know if you're aware of this, but it's really hot in L.A. Oh, <clears throat> I think this movie, uh, Gods and Monsters, came out in 97 or 96. It was in the 90s. Just for anybody that cares about that. <laughs> um, but then, for sure, it would have been hot as hell. That's what I'm sort of leading up to. It is very warm there, so... If you're working outside in the sun, strenuously, you're going to get really friggin' hot and sweaty. And so, <laughs> you can see on Ian McKellen's face the deep appreciation he has for this young man's hot, sweaty body. And he's, you know, in, he's in good shape for the time. Like, he's not the rock <laughs> or whatever. He's not even going for that. <laughs> I don't think it was a consideration then like it is today. They were really concerned about the face, I think, and the hair. And if you were just not fat, you were good to go. So, um, however it happens, Whale catches sight of Clay Boone out in the yard working and sweating. And what I meant by appreciation is, is from the shots. As I recall, maybe in not that particular scene to the degree that I'm going to say right now, 
but you can see, like I said, there was a deep appreciation for this young man out there sweating. And when they alternate shots from Boone to Whale and focus on Whale's face, you can see him looking at Boone and his mouth coming open like, <laughs> like he's going to drink him up. Sorry if that's a bit much, but if you're going to freak out about stuff like that, this is not the video for you and probably not the channel because I'm not going to discriminate. Um, it, it's a little like, for me, seeing him react that way, like I know it's in the script, but it was, it was a heartfelt <laughs> thing. I don't think there was a lot of acting there necessary. Like, I think it was pretty genuine and I felt it like it made my, not my stomach flip, but something here in my chest do something like some sort of almost rotation, you know, it was kind of interesting. It was like, wow, I am really tuned into this. And I felt like I, I think I need to like back off a little. And luckily, um, not long after that scene, <clears throat> I had to stop and interrupt uh, my viewing of it, and that completely like wiped the slate. <laughs> but um, back to the movie itself. So um, the thing about Whale is he is a World War I vet, he's a homosexual, and he's in Hollywood where it's somewhat tolerated that he is that way because it's, I don't care what anybody says, it's not a minority there or anywhere. There's all kinds of homosexuals and other type of, other than heterosexual beings and ways to be out there, you know, and ways that people are, are born. They are just that way. That's how they are. Just like I are this, this who that I am. You know, we just are who we are. Um, so, uh, he's reflecting on his life and he feels empty. He, as he tells Jimmy, he has no love. He has no movies. He has no art, no drawing, no painting. And he's dramatic and he's def definitely even though he denies it at one point and actually at several points he tries to play it off like he's not interested but it's such baloney because he, the guy who walked into his life exactly like you know that's his his kind of that's his thing like that's who he's attracted to tall handsome dark-haired man <laughs> so and the thing was is he was aware of all of this within him, you know, that was going on. He talks about it, and he even says at one point to Boone, what do you think about, I'm paraphrasing, what do you think about when people come into your life, referring to the significance of when that happens? And that is something that I personally, outside of what I'm doing and talking about right here, always... Uh, find remarkable because I understand now that people will come into your life for a long time or for just a moment's interaction but however it happens it's something that changes you and we all deal with change differently but if you're me and stuff starts changing I'm looking at it and myself and going why is whatever it is changing and you know what is this that it can affect a change on me. And I don't know, I'm just like a piggy little picker. <laughs> I gotta pick everything apart until I understand it as best I can. So that's what I have a tendency to do. But he did, well, bring it up. So it was clear to me that he, the writer, the screenwriter, is well aware of the significance of someone coming into your life and how they can positively, negatively, or neutrally, I guess, 
affect you and affect change in your life. So Boone's lo uh, lonely play. He was lonely, you know, and he was dismissed from the service and he had issues with his father where he just never got the approval that he ever wanted, which was to a lesser degree what Whale had gone through in his childhood, which you see flashbacks of. And I gotta say, whoever the, the boy is that played him young, the young man, that kid looked just like him, but I mean, was it a, is it an English template or something? Or because he's gay, I don't think he has kids. <laughs> Is it, a, is it like a family member? I don't know, but that kid looked like him so much. And I don't, I have a hard time recognizing people sometimes when they, when I see them in a youth picture compared to like, however they are as a say elderly person, I often have trouble making the connection that those are the same two people. But this kid in McKellen, oh my God, he, I'm telling you. <laughs> He could have spit him out. Um, so, McKellen is at the end of his life. He's, he, it's, I guess it's that thing they say that your life replays in front of you when you're dying, except he's not in a critical state. He's just approaching the end. So, and he even says, it sounds like he's describing like attention deficit disorder, which I think I have a touch of because he can't think of just one thing. He's got all kinds of thoughts flying at him at once and it's like overwhelming. And <clears throat> it probably was always that way. And it's probably like, I'm not elderly and it's always been that way for me. So, but um, I think you just, when you, as you age, you reach different stages of your life of development and you, learn things and you learn them differently and as you get older that difference is like more it's a it's like a thing of of like a layered construction and <clears throat> you um the texture of things as you experience them is different like you notice different things about them like if you had the same let's just call it a little sheet of leather and you have it from the time that you're say an adult, like 18 years old, you're officially an adult and it looks one way when you start, but you keep it around with you all the time and you handle it and you sweat on it and you worry it and you pull it in and out of your pocket and it gets maybe washed and it just goes through life with you. Right. And so what happens, it wears, it changes, it softens, it gets nicks and scars. It, uh, it ages like skin because it is skin. And that's maybe a strange analogy, but I feel like if that little piece of leather were your learning capacity, yes, your learning capacity that is how it would change over the course of your life and change with you in almost the same way. Except, you know, all of the skin, it lacks like the brain and all the nervous system and all that business. But because it's skin, maybe it does have the memory of that and they can, you can align with it. You can tune in with it. And, but I, you know, I'm just talking a metaphor here, but I, I have, been feeling that way of like I realized I was if I <clears throat> reflect on something that I hadn't thought about in a while my thinking about it will have changed because I have matured and changed and that's I think <clears throat> sort of the end stage of where he was at with his little piece of learning <laughs> Uh, whale. <clears throat> and so there is a scene that was like really striking and really painful. And I'm sure it was painful to perform. 
maybe also to write. I'm thinking whoever wrote this was probably a homosexual. Um, yeah, you can kind of notice that it has a a different approach angle, and the scene is sort of like the culmination of why I'm even doing this thing with Brendan Fraser. You know, it's it's a part of it aside from the entertainment part. It's a, it's personal about the guy. Per, about his personal stuff, but about how I feel about it. <laughs> Which, do I have a right to do that? I think in this case I do, because I'm not getting, like, personal about his personal life. <laughs> I'm just, like, talking about the movie stuff. But because he's a public person, he does have some public personal stuff. And I have been delving into his past recently and learning more and more about the period that I think all actors probably go through where they're just not as popular as they once were if they were fortunate enough to be very popular as he was. <clears throat> so I've been learning more about why he was gone and in one of the clip shows that I watched, which I mean, it's not coming directly from him unless he is saying it. And in this case, he was. They reported that he said that he ended up leaving Hollywood when he did because it takes a lot out of you emotionally. And I'm not sure what he would have gone through. But, I mean, if you've been paying attention in the last five or ten years, you know that there's stuff that goes on there in Hollywood that those people that want to get ahead and move forward and excel, they got to do more than excel at their craft, you know? <laughs> you got to be a people person, too, and sometimes it's ugly <laughs> from all reports. Harvey Weinstein! <clears throat> Harvey Weinstein! Excuse him. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so I don't know what he meant to be. And also, Corey... Corey Feldman. Uh, he's had some stuff to say that would it would certainly give me pause about moving from my tiny small town to Hollywood. You're basically <laughs> volunteering, electing to go crawl into a dragon's mouth. So I'm saying I was born there. So it's coming from someone who knows and who left. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean, it's hard. It's gnarly. You got to have some serious testicular fortitude <laughs> to make it there. And so I felt it really like in my heart, in my gut, when he said that it, you need to be really thick skinned and he wasn't. He didn't feel like he was thick skinned enough. And I get that. I don't know what it is, like it's the competition or... I guess it is, like, if you boil it down, it's competition. Because I wasn't in his field. But I still was running up against the same crap and the same kind of people. So, I mean, I kind of know, like, manipulative people that step all over you to get what they want. And just users. And just, it's not a, it attracts not pretty people. <laughs> they may look good on the outside, but the inside is, like, yucky. But not him, I think. I think he's very human, very, like, unaffected by that. Because I think that those people that are, like, so mercenary about it, about their uh, careers in Hollywood, where they'll, you know, without regard in a lot of cases, just take someone else, someone else down for their own benefit. You know, however you want to interpret that, it happens at all levels, all the time. I'm just going to confine that to Hollywood for the purposes of what I'm talking about right here and now. Um, but that really touched me. And you can sort of see it in his performances, in his earnestness. It comes through so genuinely. Like When you learned a little bit more about him, or when I did, I felt it to be like honest. So... I'm kind of going long here, but I'm going to quickly read something that I wrote because I don't want to just freeball this. I want to get my thoughts down exactly as I wrote them. 
Okay. Let me find my spot. Oh, Boris Karloff was played by Oh, come on. I know it's on here. Okay, I can't find it. So, anyway, this is what I wrote. McKellen's James Whale is a jaded and faded old Hollywood screenwriter, director, sketch artist, and painter. In his other life, oh, oh, in his other life, now in his strokey twilight, he's reliving his past, uh, TV, and filled with melancholy until Clayton Boone drops into his life, plays a vet. Sensitive, sweet, and open, willing to see the best in what life presents him with. Let me try that again. Plays a vet, sensitive, sweet, and open, willing to see the best in what life presents him with. Feels compassion for whale suffering and regrets. Willing to indulge the old guy to a degree, even after suffering a gut-wrenching betrayal by him. Even when reduced to a raw streaming puddle, he can still see the pain of another human all too clearly on the way out. Even enlisting to a degree in caring for Whale when his literal devoted servant is momentarily called away. Hannah, whose devotion in the end extends to Boone when she takes pains to see him not be blamed for Whale's death, he committed suicide. <clears throat> I already talked about the thick skin thing. So that kind of sums up what I was feeling about the movie itself and the dynamic between Boone and Will and also Hannah, by the way. And there was a couple of other bright spots like, uh, did I already talk about this or was I just talking to myself? Let me just repeat myself just in case. I kind of hate that if I already did it in the playback, but, oh, I did. So Kevin J. O'Connor, remember I said he was Benny in The Mummy? So in this one, he was, I think his old flame, but I'm not sure if it was the soldier or the other director that he talked to at the party that he took Boone to. But, um, yeah. <laughs> he was in there, too. <laughs> so, um, I'll have to try and remember to rectify that in the information. Okay, so that's it. I am pretty much all out of what I got to say at this point. Thank you, and good night.